Um, I'm going to, we're going to stay in Yorkshire, um, and we're going to Sheffield now, and Sam and Judith are going to be doing a joint presentation. Sam is the medical director at St Luke's Hospice Sheffield, where he's been a consultant since 2008, and Judith is the deputy chief executive and director of patient care at St Luke's, and is also the chair of the executive clinical leaders in hospice palliative care group. So I'm handing over to both of you. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. We just want to share with you our experience to date of telemedicine, which in part, I have to thank Richard and the Airedale team, was inspired by the work we saw when we paid a visit there back in 2013 and following that, a visit that we had to Canada and uh, the States to see telemedicine live in action. Um, we started that journey in particular when we started to look at our community services and start to wonder how we were going to deliver health care to our community patients in the coming years. The challenges we face are no different to the challenges that any of you face around sustainability and survival with an ageing population, multiple comorbidities. We needed to really think about how we would have a workforce that was fit for purpose as we entered 2016 onwards. And that's the work that we've started to look at and to consider. The challenges, as we look at them, don't sit in isolation of all the guidance that's come out at a national level. Ambitions for palliative care we'll touch on in a little while. One chance to get it right obviously made transformational changes to the way we have to think about delivering health care. And we've got the nice guidance for care of the dying person. I've already talked about the ageing population and Sheffield will be no different to any other parts of the country. And for me, as Director of Patient Care, it was also considering the nursing workforce as we move forward. We've got, I think, a 20,000 shortfall in nursing at the moment, predicted to get worse over the coming years. And we've got a workforce, again, within nursing that is ageing and will be retiring. So it was really with all these factors in mind that Sam and I and the team at St. Luke's started to consider what the future might look like. And as we made that consideration, we started to think about other initiatives that were happening within the UK. The Palliative Care Funding Re Review, we're involved in Wave 1 of that pilot. We haven't been involved in Wave 2, but we have been integral to the work with Public Health England, looking at the data collection set. And a lot of you will be familiar with OAK, which sits within that data set. We also were looking locally at the drivers within our healthcare community, which will be subtly different to the drivers within your community. The diverse population that Sheffield serves of just over half a million. So as we were looking at this, we then had the guidance that came out earlier this year from ambitions for palliative and end of life care and those six key themes that sat within it. I don't propose to go through those now, but they're up on screen for you. And just hold those in your mind, I would suggest, while Sam then describes some of the work which is in its early stages. And I was really pleased to see Richard's slide on proof of concept because that kind of feels where we are at the moment. So I think what's really important to say is our chief executive was really clear with the two of us when we started this journey that technology is not the answer and nothing should ever, ever go away from direct patient and family contact. So the patients and families have been central and intricate to our work as we've progressed this. Human contact has to be central to what we do. And I think, you know, in any part of the health sector, that's critical. But in end-of-life care, where we do only get one chance to get it right, I think it's particularly pertinent. So our service development is enabled by the technology that you're going to hear about. It's not as a result of it. So I'm going to hand over to Sam now. This has been a wonderful journey for us, and I think um, some of the things that Richard said are, are really echoed very strongly with us in terms of our journey in telemedicine um, development, or this development that we're undertaking. Partnership is critical, but I think one of the things for us at the Hospice UK conference that's really important, listening to Richard talk about the challenges within encouraging um, development within wider systems and within the NHS, the, having the agility of being a hospice and having the partnerships that we have having the confidence and the faith and the support of our trustees um, to make this development has been integral to us kind of growing. 
But this has been a partnership journey that, that really started with an approach to us by um, Professor Sue Monson, Monson and um, Professor Fitzsimmons um, from Western University in Canada, who's actually with us in the stage today, and she will be, she's had a, got a poster presentation, so I would encourage you to go and see that. Um, but it was really about the Clark approaching us and suggesting that there was a piece of technology that might be out there. And what we had was the vision and the energy and the agility to be able to think about how that might work, working with a, a technology firm, Sensory Technology, and supported by the work of um, Western University and the School of Health and Related Research at Shah through the Clark. This really led to the development of the Encompass project, and we, we hope to go live properly in January, and all this development is leading us up to that point. Enhanced community palliative care support services. Now, really, the goal of this was there were four key things for us to try and achieve um, as we looked forward. One was to really enhance the quality, the accuracy of our documentation and our assessments and uh, really enable effective caseload management as a way of delivering scalability for our community team and for our services at large. Another was really to embed or enable the embedding of um, patient reported outcome measures in our clinical work and in our MDT system, a really a thing that we thought was vital to really demonstrate the value that hospice care brings, um, but also allow us to have levels of overnight oversight, governance and assurance that we were delivering the right things within our clinical teams. Um, it also allowed us to develop, build on a concept that we saw in Canada, the act of delegated nursing, um, which Judith will um, expand on a little bit in a little bit of time. And we think that's one of the most powerful and potentially disruptive elements of this technology. But also then to allow us to start to think about developing models of reinforced caregiving. Kind of building on the concept of, of where Goldline has, has taken us, building on the evidence and the strength of evidence that it has offered us. But actually, if we can enable carers to support us in delivering care, we might actually allow us to manage the shortfall in nursing. You know, there are carers out there who need our help, who just need our help to walk them and talk them through a process. This system requires very simple technology. Another thing that Richard talked about was at the start of the telemedicine journey, um, technologies were quite expensive. And this system really relies on a simple smartphone. Not necessarily the top of the line smartphone, just a simple smartphone. And for our staff, it allows us to use a various range of technologies. I'll show you some screens in just a moment. But it also allows us to do some real-time time in motion. It allows us to do safety checks for our staff because it has GPS that they show when they arrive in a patient's home and when they leave. Um, it allows us to do a whole range of different activities as proven in Canada and North America. And the very fact that it was proven in Canada and um, well, in USA, you know, in particular in the US, which we all recognize as a, a highly litigious area, for that to have the confidence of, of healthcare providers gave us confidence that this could be safe and usable. So these are um, just some examples of screens that we might have. Um, and these are still being worked up just in, in anticipation of our launch. But um, what we have is the capacity to arrive at a patient's home, um, to do a check-in where we check the environment, do a very basic screen and assessment of what's going on with the patient. Now, that information will form the basis of a deeper assessment. But what it will also allow us to do is to, when we're doing delegates of delegated acts of care, shoot that assessment up the line to a specialist nurse. Now, that might come from various levels of nursing, so they have the ability to um, make, support that, that clinician out in the field with what they're doing. Um, we have a range of different assessments. Now, this is all on a mobile phone, um, using a touchscreen mobile phone, not using anything more complex. We have got the capacity to use this technology on a tablet for those of our staff who are challenged by um, big thumbs and uh, the challenges of using. So we can use different interfaces. It's the piece of technology that suits our staff members the best. Um, and that will allow us then to do detailed pain assessments. Um, and this is just a simple type of version of the pain assessment. There are more detailed ones which might integrate things like um, the Leeds um, Neuropathic Pain Assessment Tool and a whole host of different tools that we can use, really enhancing the quality of what our, our staff are collecting. We also are using iPaws and iPaws 5 embedded into the technology, which allows us to um, really gather the data, um, not only as part of the individual um, patient 
uh, data collection process, but it actually is at the heart of our clinical governance process, both in our MDTs and in our other meetings. Now, a big part of this is taking that data and embedding it into multidisciplinary practice. Okay, so that's the clinician in the home and for our MDT to offer assurance um, and to offer, ensure that we're offering high quality care at all times. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you a very short video of our MDT. Just, there are, is some intimate detail discussed in the, the MDT. We do have patient consent, so don't worry about that. Um, but it's a short video and it illustrates our MDT as it is now, embedding patient reported outcome measures as we go. Now, one of the, one of the things that, we, that I, I sort of talked about is it enabling development. We've taken a step to go this far, but without the technology that we're describing, we think it may have been challenging to take that to the sorts of levels that we are anticipating soon. So, can we play the video, please? Malignant near plasma vovary, secondary malignant near plasma of lung, haven't got a resus status, this patient's deteriorating, requires occasional assistance, and undecided at this stage regarding preferred location of death. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, this patient completed their IPOS on the 17th with the help of you, Lynn. Didn't yeah. break their overall quality of life, didn't say whether things had got better or worse, but said they got the information they wanted most of the time. Problems they identified over the last three days were vulval discomfort and fatigue, and pain severity is one mild. <coughs> It is, but um, I would say generalised discomfort, although she, you know, she scored herself as one mild, mm. her generalised discomfort, mainly because she has a, um, a, a bladder, vaginal, rectal, fistula. So for pain, she's just either taking paracetamol or cocodamol, knowing that she shouldn't take a combination of all and eight in a day. She gets a bit of backache and she says that's effective for the backache. Um, obviously, she, she's very sore in her vulval area, and she's got either, at the moment, Sudoprem, aqueous cream, and she's got Cavalon cream that had been suggested by um, the stoma nurse because she does have a loop colostomy. Do you mind, while the word is in my head, if you don't mind, yeah. in terms of the, the discharge, it's Ilex ointment, it's ILEX, which um, the GPs can prescribe. Um, I've used it one patient and it's come from some family experience actually and it okay. doesn't come off right. and it doesn't stick and it's really useful when you've got a, a massive amount of sort of faeces yeah. urine coming out yeah. so it performs a really good barrier much better than metanium and yeah. the others um, but it's a stoma product mm. right. okay. Okay. so um, if she's getting the redness and soreness like we thought she was yeah. just as the interim while yeah. she's thinking just to try that I'm hoping she'll agree I think she probably will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Lynn. So, shortness of breath, she scored zero. Any no. issues or actions? No. no okay. Other the physicals, she scored three uh, around weakness and lack of energy. She yeah. scored two for poor appetite and two for drowsiness and one dry sore mouth and poor mobility. So, an overall score is severe. Yeah, she does feel fatigued due to her condition and she chooses to sleep downstairs on the sofa. It's a little cottage. The bathroom's at the other end of the kitchen. So, there's no toilet washing facilities upstairs, so um, you know she prefers to sleep on the sofa where she can get easier access. She did have a, she's got a commode upstairs, but then she says I, I can't wash myself, so this is what she's preferring to do at the moment. Okay. So. I think, I think that's, that those things are rack is a significant concern for her they you know, are. inability to meet her own hygiene needs, yeah, exactly. and also the issue about this. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the kind of the leaking from mm. the fistula. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously there's things that are probably need to be a focus for us, but it would be mm. useful for her or for us to be able to describe them in the context of how significant they are for her. Absolutely. Mm. Um, okay, psychospiritually she's going to moderate yeah, around anxiety about her illness. Yeah, psychospiritually um, she says she's had a very difficult life, including an abusive husband who she's now divorced from. Her daughter died suddenly from a brain hemorrhage 12 years ago, leaving two young children who are now 16 and 22. Um, she says she cannot cry. She's learned to be brave through everything she's been through to support her family and um, through the traumas that they've all suffered. So she says, I, I just don't cry. Um, very, very, very talkative. Um, and I've just written to the GP that she clearly will need support with this over the coming months. Okay, so family care, we can put that into yeah. there. Yeah. Um, she scored two, which is moderate around anxiety yeah. about family and friends and yeah. able to share her feelings, which is probably what you've alluded to already, yeah. and any practical issues, she scored one. Yeah, um, her, she's got a son, David, who's a teacher. Um, he's got two teenage children. 
She said David often cries and she knows he's worried about her. So, um, and he was only present for a very short time. He had to go okay. and have a visit. And, um, you know, obviously we can suggest mm -hmm. the Cavendish Centre, yeah. etc. for him. That's our MDT process. Um, now, the MDT is not really a multidisciplinary team as we would describe it, because in a, a, a more formal multidisciplinary team, what we'd like is a physiotherapist there, we'd like maybe an occupational therapist there, other elements of our wellbeing team, and that's not necessarily possible to deliver that. That's kind of a bi-professional team, nursing and medicine there in that meeting. What we hope to do with the technology is to be able to scale things very differently. And using the data entry that we've described, we can then turn this around. And rather than about being about capturing patients' individual situations and managing them or delegating information up to a directing nurse to get advice on how to manage something, what we're then doing is drawing down that information from the database. And it's allowing us to select out a course of patients to discuss in our MDT. We can use it to allocate and prioritize patients for discussion um, to make things uh, more detailed. What we also then have is patient dashboards where we can draw down the information from the iPods to understand what's going on with their symptoms, look at what's going on with care or distress, um, so we, we've got a scale for care or distress which we can measure. Now, as part of the Oak measures, you might want to use, for example, the Zarek Burden questionnaire. That's not something we're quite at yet, but there is a tool that we will use to allow us to capture that data. We also have a track for other physical problems where they'll be scored. And what this does is it allows us to concentrate within our MDT. The, the whole process is about making the MDT the brain that operates everything, that our whole system is not medic-based practice, nurse-led practice, it's MDT-based practice. And that sits within the technology that allows us to enhance and develop this process. What we also then have is we're able to capture information out of that and create these instructions, which we can then shoot off to the nurse. So next time they go out, out of the, um, into practice, they've got an instruction waiting in their phone for them when they arrive that will tell them the things that the MDT has requested them to do. Um, and so do more detailed assessments. And there we have our governance and our development process to support how things have grown and how we imagine things will develop. I'll just hand over to Judith just to talk about the delegated nursing component a little bit. Okay, so we're going to focus now just for a couple of slides on the delegated nurse component of this technology. I said at the start of the presentation the challenge within the nursing workforce. I've also had a challenge actually recruiting band seven nurses into community. This enables us to look at our model in the community setting in a very different way. And when we started this project, what we were hoping to do was pilot it within nursing homes with assistant practitioners, so level four nurses. Unfortunately, we didn't get the funding for that. We got the funding from the Nursing Tech Fund for 250K. And so we are going to pilot this using band D, so registered nurses from our ward setting, going into community, something which actually would have been very challenging to do. Community is a very different um, ball game, as we all know, to working on an inpatient centre, but those nurses are often aspiring future band six, seven nurses. So this is a process enables, through the live data capture and the tele-technology, for that band D to go into a patient's home and just as a traditional ward nurse like myself was used to as a student having your senior standing by your side guiding you through your procedures so through the act of delegation and that live transmission the band D nurse can go into the patient's home wherever that may be private residential nursing home to actually carry out advanced acts of delegation and it is safe because the nurse is constantly mentored. And it was fascinating when we were over in the States, we actually went out with an assistant practitioner. They're called Tex over there. And the patients actually knew who the delegated nurse was because they were so familiar with the service that was being delivered. And they could tell when their delegated nurse changed, just as on a ward, you can probably tell one registered nurse to another, but you can physically see them. So how this works, um, you have your directing nurse, which is a band seven, band six. It might be a member of the medical team, dependent on the patient's needs. And then it acts as a force multiplier. So you can have your assistant practitioners, or in our case, at this early implementation stage, our band D nurses 
going out into patients' homes. We saw a slide earlier from Rag, um, Airedale looking at the RAG rating. We'll be piloting this probably with our amber and green patients in the first place. But the nurse can go into the home. As Sam said, as soon as they leave the hospice, they will be live with their delegated nurse. When they arrive at the home, they will sign in. And from then on, there will be constant mentoring and guidance from the nurse. So they can reach out to more patients from a resource perspective. And I have to stress, we are not doing this for resources. It's actually cost effective. And we believe, just like Airedale have from their data, that it will avoid unnecessary hospital admissions and enable patients to stay at home if that is their preferred place of death. And it will also enable us to reach out to more of our population in Sheffield. That's a very snapshot overview of the active delegation. If people are interested and want to talk to us later, please feel free, but I'm conscious of time now. So that's where, where we've gotten to. I suppose where we hope to get to, and it's kind of contingent on future funding and our work with the Clark, um, really trying to get these bids through, but it's to grow the technology. We really think this, is, this has got potential to be a game changer. And if we couple it with the kind of work that is happening at Airedale, if we look at how the gold line has transformed things, we think that, that this sort of technology can take things to another level. So we look at the example of expanding delegated acts um, to assistant practitioners, but why not just about acts of nursing care? Why not um, the actual technology developed originally as a physiotherapy tool? So why not allow us to use it to um, increase the activity of our allied health professionals. Um, St. Christopher's, I don't know if anyone went to um, the uh, rehabilitative palliative care session at St. Christopher's, but they've got a great pilot looking at um, using volunteers to roll out work. Well, this is a way of taking that to another level still, because you can actively be rolling out different kinds of activity and assessments live, getting feedback and making interventions. But if you could not only do that with volunteers, why can't we do that with carers? You know, I, th I often comment in community, I, I have had numerous relatives in, in the case of caregiving where they've been desperate to be able to administer injections to their loved ones. But actually, as a sector, we are, and in healthcare, we are absolutely terrified of enabling our loved ones, our carers, to administer medication to the patients, partly because it feels like there's no governance supporting them. But we, why not allow this to develop new models of reinforced caregiving? You know, taking it to another level that we can teach and train our relatives, our carers, to, to deliver care actually as a way of enhancing, strengthening our service rather than waiting half an hour to four hours for a district nurse to arrive if they can use the kind of communications that they have in the gold line. These are, these are kind of processes that we think are really deliverable that can change everything. E-clinics, obviously, they do in Airedale. The virtual MDT is another thing. If you imagine that what we want to be able to do is to draw our healthcare teams closer together, we're talking about potentially people being able to dial in. You can see that we've got lots of nurses sitting around that table, but actually to have to come back to base to be in that MDT presents a challenge in itself. Why couldn't they dial in at a peripheral office and be part of that virtual MDT and be able to do more visits out in community? Take that a step further. Why is it just our allied health professionals or just our community nurses dialing in? Why can't the sector district nurse team lead dial in? Why can't the GP dial in and be part of our weekly MDT based on sectors and practice? There are whole different ways of practicing that allow us to enable and bring our teams together much better across sectors and across organizations. And we believe that the agility of the hospice has allowed us to think like this. Um, on top of that, we have the concept around um, development of personalized web pages. We're, we're hoping to hear more from um, various different teams and, and dynamic health systems and others about ways of, of patient held records can allow us to access things, um, to, to look at EPACs in a different way. To, and so these are all different kinds of technology that give the power to our patients, to um, a range of patients, also like the, the silver surf, surfer that um, that Linda showed us, that actually it's not hard if we can get the technology working right for us. So if we think about the ambitions for palliative care, and we think about Encompass, or telemedicine as a step forward, as a concept, we think that this technology can allow us to see each, people, each person as an individual. It can enable us 
to get fair access and open up access to care. We believe that with skilled, um, assured, multidisciplinary team working and supervision and robust assessment processes, we can maximise comfort and deliver high quality service. We believe fundamentally this enables proper coordination of care in the truest sense. Um, and not, not only are our staff are prepared to care, but they are enabled to care. And we believe that if we can build this step, we can develop the concept of reinforced caregiving, that we can enable communities to care for themselves with support. Uh, just as demonstrated in Linda's video, we think this is all possible. And I think as a hospice who've driven this, you know, I think that our movement really has the capacity to do things differently, to be disruptive, because we were disruptive when we started, we can be disruptive again in a very creative and positive way. Thank you. Thank you. We've got uh, 10 minutes for some questions, and there's two mics, um, one and two, and there's some roving mics as well that Jean's got. So, is there any? Yes? Over there. Uh, Rob George, St Christopher's, stunking stuff, guys. Top, top draw. Uh, absolutely excellent. Um, the, these things have been worrying me for years, and I think one of the things, that it's, a, it's a sort of common stroke question and a really specific question. Um, and that, that is, is this going to help us to move from a blame avoidance culture to a risk avoidance culture? In other words, the default position in health and social care at the moment is, is for organisations to avoid blame rather than to avoid harm to patients. And I think that using this kind of stuff, particularly when you're drawing family and, and the people who are dying into the equation, then maybe we can shift to harm avoidance rather than blame avoidance. So I value a comment on that. And then something really specific question. You say you're covering about half a million on the Airedale a project. How many nurses do you have on your switchboard? Um, do you mean at any one time? Yeah. Uh, it depends on the time of day um, and it's changing all the time because the service is growing and the telemedicine service is growing. Um, so we, we started off with one and then at busy times they had two and now they have two plus a backup. Uh, uh, even, uh, well, they, know, they know where the hotspots are, so early evening till about midnight, okay. and then 6am till so, 9. So you, you can load according to, to, to hot times of the day, yeah, and they the also, rush hours as it were. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and they have a backup because they, they work with the hospital at night team. Um, yeah. So there is a, there's some more acute care nurses out in the hospital who they can sort of call in if they need to. Any idea of the maximum capacity of population? But you could, um, you talk about half a million now, what, what would be the optimum population? I work in London, right? Well, the only limiting factor really is the number of nurses you've got taking the calls um, and the skill of those nurses. Um, I, I think the, the population, we, we've talked about providing it for another area and we think we could do it and the hub think they could do it. They all, the, the model for care homes is already out, out of the area, so as long as they have access to um, the, the community-based services in that area and the community-based services are responsive, which is important, obviously, um, then there's really no reason why they couldn't spread it to a, more, a bigger area, the model. Great. Do you want to, to... I just say it's fractal, really, so uh, both the technology and the, uh, the staffing model can expand in a sort of fractal way. Um, I was just going to comment about um, the harm avoidance and uh, risk avoidance. I think what the tools, the simplicity of the tools and appropriate training allows us to do is to capture detailed assessment. And so, you know, we can, we can be confident if the tools are used correctly and we can audit how, how well the tools are used. Um, we can be confident that we're gathering appropriate information. And because of the way that we've structured the MDT processes within the system that we're developing, what it allows us to do is to be robust on a daily basis we're having um, mini MDT meetings, we're analysing the data, we're escalating and de-escalating. These are all the concepts that the technology has allowed us to do that practically would not have been possible without it. And so I think if we then add in the family members and the carers and we add robust assessments and training through reinforced caregiving teaching models, so there are established ones but not perhaps at this level, then I think that it, it adds something different and I think that it does move us away from this... Um, anxiety and moves us into safer, more enhanced care. Hi, hi. 
My name is Max Watson, I'm from Northern Ireland Hospice. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I think they're just really exciting presentations of, and a glimpse of how things could be in, in our future, or how things actually desperately need to be in our future because of what's coming towards us demographically. I, I guess my question is one, uh, uh, we're just starting a similar sort of approach uh, in relation to, to carers, actually directly involving carers. And, and we see that as, as actually the, the huge game changer. But it's a, a radical step for healthcare professionals to kind of, uh, uh, I think the, 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 the phrase is democratization of medical knowledge. And that, that scares us so much. And I guess one of our biggest impediments is the amount of antibodies that are generated amongst healthcare professionals at the thought of carers taking responsibility. When you actually are with the carers themselves, they are saying, this is, this is what we want to do. We, we will choose. If we get upset, that's our choice. If we make mistakes, that will be uh, our thing. But uh, So how have you dealt with the antibodies? I mean, I think Richard described the, the whole process of, of disruptive technology and actually trying to take clinicians with you. Um, and, you know, we're, we're very lucky at St Luke's that we have the support of our senior team and we have, we've worked very, very hard to gain the support of our clinical teams who are, are going through this. I'm not saying it's a given, it is hard work. We need to soothe and comfort people, you know, and, and to try and make them feel less anxious. Now, we haven't launched properly and we already find that resistance. Um, and we anticipate that if we go into different kinds of ways of working and different models, delegating responsibility and care acts to carers, the democratisation of healthcare as you describe it, I suspect that will only get more. But for me, the value of the particular process that we're involved in is because we have robust evidence, because we have a connection, we have proper assessment, proper reporting, and it's live, what we can do is we can gather the data to address the naysayers. And so then it becomes, it becomes apparent when it's more about personal anxiety rather than system anxiety. It's very easy for clinicians and for um, services to cloak um, a reason for, develop, for halting development in lots of risk avoidance behaviour or, you know, and, and if we can get the evidence to say, really, it's not any more risky than we're doing it now, then actually, then we can start to have a rational discussion and debate. Can I just say something, and this is so simple, uh, and I really don't want to be patronising, but I think one of the things, and it's not the answer, but it goes part way, is just acknowledging how the staff feel. Um, and that acknowledgement coming from the top of the organisation to say, we know that this is scary, we know that it's potentially threatening. In many ways, the similarities are when we started introducing volunteers into um, the work of the healthcare professional teams. You know, there's still some resistance there. But actually, being honest with your staff and saying, this isn't about replacing you, it's about working alongside you. Um, talking with them and helping them understand the challenges that we all in the room know. I, I, I do think it's simple, it's not as complex an answer as Sam gave you, um, but I just think the humane side of saying it's scary and it's okay to be scary goes part way. Um, just at a very practical level, I didn't give the example, but um, one of our carers who lived in a very rural setting um, who wanted to be able to give her father subcutaneous injections um, and that uh, sometimes creates problems, not least for the carer themselves and the anxiety around giving them injection and then dying and, uh, and how they feel about that. So we, um, uh, we worked fantastically. We got, uh, if she felt that um, her dad needed something, she rang up on the iPad. This, the nurse in, in the hub said, yeah, it looks like he needs some um, it does lamb. I agree with you. Do you want to give it? And then they could support her till she was confident. And then everyone was happy. Uh, and it did work fantastically. And she, she wrote us a brilliant letter at the end to say, how much she'd love doing that, but how having the support of the team made her feel very confident. So that was a really good example. Um, maybe I should have shared that one. C can I ask you a question? Are you thinking as you go down this pathway with your carers, at working with your local academic centres to consider developing certificates for carers? Because one of the things that's quite apparent is that carers often put their life on hold 
to care for their loved ones. They actually learn very complex tasks that are skill sets in themselves. But then when their loved ones died and they have to go back into the workplace, a lot of work places don't recognise that and we've certainly heard that from carers we've heard spoken. Yeah, we actually had the, the, the really crazy big idea of creating a carers university. Uh, an Brilliant. A place where they could develop skills yeah. in self-advocacy, in taking care of themselves, in becoming knowledgeable about uh, the diseases, processes that they're involved with and, and, uh, and advocate themselves for, for better recognition from our government that people who are carers deserve a much better access to, to resource than they currently do. So Absolutely. it'd be Great. nice to do a, a That's really interesting. connection. Great. I think we've got time for one very quick question. So I'm going to go over to there, Mike, too. I'm Brendan Amesbury. I'm in uh, Chichester in West Sussex. We're working with two other local hospices and the CCG and the Community Trust to set up something like the Goal Line. Uh, we hadn't really understood that there was anywhere else like it in the country, but it's good to know we were thinking Gold Line was the name as well. Um, <coughs> our system's going to be that the call handlers pass calls they can't manage onto on-call hospice nurses, which will be a slightly different model to yours. I'm really pleased I came to this session today, because I, I hadn't thought that what we were doing was telemedicine. We don't use that phrase at all, which I find really interesting. My question is, the CCG wanted us to have 90% of uh, people in the next year of life expected to die on the register. We've managed to winkle them down to 75% of identification. You're only on 40%. Do you think, how high can we get with that sort of number? Um, well, if you, we've got one practice that's got 110% um, who are very well engaged, and they are very well engaged with care homes. Um, we're actually looking at, we're trying to work out who are the missing people. We suspect, but we're not sure, but we suspect it's frail elderly who are missing. And um, we're doing some work with Professor Young, who's frailty lead, national lead, looking at frailty index and whether that could uh, be, we could use that to identify some frail elderly. Um, I think we can, I think we can, I don't think, I'd be surprised if we can get to uh, anywhere near 90%, but I think we can probably get to 60 to 70. Okay, that, that's a sort of alliance. That's just a guess. Really. We, we think 90% is an outrageously yeah. nice. We have millions of people, no, tens of people referred to the hospice since you died before they get seen because they get referred so late and ID so late. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm afraid the session has to come to a close, but I'm sure our speakers will be around to answer any questions over the next few minutes. Um, can I thank the speakers for making my task very easy as chair, and can I thank you all for attending the session? Thank you very much.